various. Um, we always like to start our meetings by welcoming our new members. Do we have any new members in the audience here today? No, not today. Maybe we have some online. If you're a new member online, uh, feel free to raise your hand or say hi in the chat. Um, we also like to thank our returning members. Thank you all so much for being a part of our, our chapter and our organization. And it's been so unbearably hot lady, lately. And um, a lot of what we see out there in the landscape looks kind of dead and brown. But there's, if you look closely, there's actually a lot of really interesting um, life out there, like this um, Gulf fritillary that is actively laying eggs. This was uh, taken recently. There's the egg on the passion flower. The passion flower vine is growing like crazy, as are a lot of other plants. So this is a really great time to not just look at what's out there all brown and dead looking, but to actually recognize the amazing life that's that's thriving out there in these extreme conditions. Okay, we have a few announcements. This is the time of year when we start thinking about changing our board positions. And we know that we are looking to have a new secretary in on our board. If that is of interest to you, please reach out to us, let us know. Um, if there are any other positions that you might be interested on the board, We've got a uh, president, vice president, treasurer, secretary, and um, two members at large that make up the board. And then we also have a variety of committees. And so if you're interested at all or curious at all in serving in any positions, um, please just reach out to us at sanantonio.nipsot.org. We're happy to talk to you, uh, let you know what the different positions entail, and um, we're always looking for new people, um, new ideas to help us keep this uh, chapter growing and, and going on. And we're, we're a pretty amazing group of people that work really well together too. So we do have some native landscape certification program classes coming up that the San Antonio chapter is sponsoring on October 14th at San Antonio Botanical Garden. We're having an in-person all day class on the Native Landscaping for Birds companion class. And then on October 21st here at Phil Harburger Park, another in-person all day class, the level two landscape design with native plants. We do have scholarships available. We do not want the fee for these classes to prohibit anyone from attending. So please reach out if you're interested in that. Um, again, to San Antonio at nipsot.org. Okay, I guess Zoom is not seeing our slides. It's not going up. It's right there, actually. It's on the screen. I wonder if they were confused because they could, uh, we were just seeing your face. It's fine. Oh, now we're fine. No, we just uh, see your face. We're seeing it here. Okay, so I guess you guys aren't seeing this slide. Sorry, people on Zoom, people in the room are seeing it. Let me try this over. Apologize. I don't know, something weird happened. Are you seeing it now? Thank you. So something really weird happened at the beginning of all this, which is probably what. Thank you, guys. Sorry, you would think I would know how to do this after all these times. Now? Yes. <laughs> Too many things. All right, sorry about that, people on Zoom. Um, all right, we'll just keep going. Here's those Native Landscape Certification Program classes I was talking about, October 14th, October 21st. And the important thing here is that registration for the classes is gonna open on August 1st. We have a fourth Saturday Nature Walk series coming up on August 26th from eight to 10 here, uh, meeting at the Urban Ecology Center. This is going to be Cheryl Hamilton. And the topic is invasive plants, stop the spread.
And then because we're not going to have an August meeting, I'm highlighting here our fourth Saturday nature walk series for September. It'll be on the 23rd, again, from eight to 10 here at the Urban Ecology Center, led by Cleve Powell. And the focus is going to be on grasses of Phil Harburger Park. All right, we have a call for volunteers and the event is Sustain the Migration, Go Native at the Nectar Bar. It's going to be on September 9th when the Nectar Bar opens back up for the season. The event is actually from 10 to five, but there are going to be multiple shifts that you can volunteer for. And Pam has a sign up sheet. Oh, she's right there in the back. If you wanna sign up while you're here, uh, or you can go to the nips.volunteers at gmail.com to find out more information or let her know you're interested in signing up and which shift you'd like to sign up for. And what you'll be doing there is helping people understand what plants are there, what native plants are there and helping them to tailor those plants for their um, interests and their site conditions. So it's usually a really fun time when we get to do that. And then we also want you to save the date. We have an all native uh, landscape nursery you may have heard about, Paula Natives, that's going to be opening up the grand opening Friday, September 1st. So save that date, uh, stay tuned for more information. They have, um, they're on Facebook and on Instagram. Uh, so make sure you save that date, that's gonna be in Converse. Our next chapter meeting is September 26th, and we're going to have Michelle Gorham from the amazing company, Native American Seed Company, out of Junction, based out of Junction. And Michelle's going to be talking about uh, creating a pocket fairy to restore the earth. All right, if you're watching on Zoom and you're a SAWS Water Saver Rewards Points person, take a picture of that QR code or go to that link at the bottom, that SurveyMonkey link, because you're going to need to answer the questions on the quiz that are based on tonight's presentation. And you'll want to do that right after the presentation while it's fresh in your mind. It's blocking the words. This is blocking the words. You can't, um, we click on more? Yeah, it's okay. So you just need to just click on link and probably do that. Okay, good evening. Great. Good evening, everyone. I'm Mark DeKivitt, and somehow some of this electronics is going to work for us tonight. So you just have to bear with me. I know the first thing you're missing, I've got the title wrong. Same topic, <laughs> just the title wrong. We are what we eat uh, from a bee's perspective. I forget what I put up there. Uh, and what I'm going to cover tonight is briefly the life of bees, honey bees particularly, but we will talk about native bees and native plants because without you guys, I wouldn't have bees and I wouldn't have bees giving me honey. So there are two types of beekeepers that we have. We have what we call the treatment and the non-treatment beekeepers. The difference is those that treat put chemicals in the hive to counteract diseases, mites, and other critters in the hive. Non-treaters use biology to do the same effect, but without any of the chemicals. We also have two types of hive management, those that feed and those that don't feed. So I fall in the category of a non-treater and I do not feed my production hives. So I'm 100% dependent on the flowers the bees uh, find. The bee that I farm is what I refer to as our Texas feral bee. And some of you might say, well, what's that? It's not a species on its own. No, it's not. It is what is referred to as the Africanized bee. Hollywood tells us it's the killer bee. Somebody forgot to tell my bees that because sometimes they are so gentle. Uh, I had some guys from Florida and in the state of Florida and the state of California, by law, you have to burn the bees if they're Africanized. Uh, we had a bunch of them with me this weekend and photographed them standing next to the hives which they duly taken back because they can't believe how calm they are. So let's have a look at I hope it's the next slide, I don't remember. Uh, so the story I'm gonna tell you is about the honeybee. 
And the difference between the feral bee and the European honeybee is very small. Um, the feral bee is about half the size of the European honeybee. It is the bee, to, bee of the future. It will be the bee that we'll be farming in several years time because it's a survivor. So here's one of them just hanging on a branch. You'll notice the saddlebags are full, uh, hopefully with pollen from native plants. So we're gonna talk about uh, the um, honeybee. As you can see there on the right-hand side, it's a very furry animal. In fact, it has more hair on its body than we do. It's an insect, six legs, two antenna, the body is divided into three sections. The unique thing about the bee, or well, several unique things about the bee is, um, first of all, it only has one tube for blood, the whole body. In other words, everything in there is raised in white blood, not red. And the reason why it's white, because it doesn't have hemoglobin. It doesn't have hemoglobin because the blood doesn't transfer oxygen to the muscles. It has a series of tubes that are, that are air tubes that conduct the air, air directly to the muscle and the oxygen con uh, transfers directly into the muscle and then the carbon dioxide and lactic acid comes straight out. This gives the bee the advantage of flexing the muscles about 200 times a second, incredibly fast. So we'll go and talk a bit more about them as it comes around. So the topic tonight is we are what we eat. And uh, I like some of those products, but not all of them. Um, it's just like if we feed our kids junk, how can we expect them to grow up to be healthy? And unfortunately, uh, it's not an immediate reaction. It's decades later, you start picking up problems with your health as a result of it. Uh, there are a lot of textbooks out there, a lot of papers, peer-reviewed papers that show, are showing trends between the different chemicals, the fact of going to low fat or no fat, and then increasing the sugar content of our food, the repercussions that had on our lives with respect to various diseases like celiac disease uh, as a result of that. Well, the bees are not much different. Unfortunately, if you, say, if you feed the bee sugar water all the time, which is what our treatment uh, our feeders do, sugar is basically just two types of sugar. There's no other nutrients in it. And even if you put probiotics in it and vitamins and minerals into it, it is still not a complete meal for bees. The resulting is the bees are weak. They're very susceptible to disease as well as to mites. And that's why our managed colonies in the US die at a rate of about 65% of them die a year which means we spend more than half our time having to reproduce new colonies to try and replace those that are lost. Just before COVID hit, we just imported 15 million hives out of Australia to try and replace the hives that were lost that year. Uh, the non-treatment, non-feeding bee community, they report losses of about half a cent a year. So even when you have the facts, we still do not follow them. So what we're trying to do is we want to feed the bees a variety of food, and hence the picture on the right. Uh, so that will give them a much more balanced nutrition and hence to be a lot more uh, healthy. So why am I involved in beekeeping? Because somebody told me to. She's sitting at the back of the room, my wife. <laughs> I, it's a hobby. It's a self-paying hobby. But more importantly, I use it for research, not only on bees, but because bees are what I call the canaries in the environment. They tell me what's going on in the environment in terms of other insects as well as native plants. Now their lifespan in summer is a five to six weeks. So there's a very fast turnover. They can adapt to changes in the environment within a year, simply because the two factors. One is they have got a short lifespan. The second thing is the drone. Anybody know what the drone is? The most important person in the hive, it's the male that gets kicked out by the females when food gets scarce. The male is unique. He ha doesn't have a double DNA strand. He has a single DNA strand. And the advantage that it gives him is the ability to, to switch on and switch off genes to accommodate any changes in the climate. The bees have been on this earth since before the dinosaurs, and they're able to adapt pretty fast, not as fast as we are changing at the moment. And there's a lovely topic called phenology going on. And, uh, book, at least a clip here for the Master Naturalist at our conference coming up next month down in the Brownsville. We've got a whole topic, a whole section on phenology, how the, the, the environment is changing the cycles of the plants and the insects and how they're not synchronizing. So bees to me, tell me what's going on in the environment because I can capture them and I can look at them. I constantly get asked, well, what about Africanized bees? So let's get this over and done with. 
We have a European honeybee in the States, which is not native to the States, but the other 4,000 bees plus are native to the States. So those pharmaceutical companies are telling we don't have native bees in the, in the country are incorrect. And uh, of that, we have, it says 600, but I need to update that. We have now over a thousand bees, different bee species identified in Texas. And we estimate that in any one area alone, there's over 230 different species of bees in that area. So we don't have the European honeybee as native, but we do have two types of honeybees in here. The one that was most important to the Indians and the Mayans were the stingless bee, a honeybee that doesn't have a sting. But as humans, we are so great, we have, been, we have been succeeded in exterminating them from the US. Isn't that proud of us? Uh, that's probably the worst enemy for the bees is what. So as I said, all my hives are feral. They're all African genetics. They're not the killer bees. And to prove that, there's some pictures of some kids that I take into the hives and give them some training on it. They're like any bee, you've got to understand them. It does require a, much, a different um, way of managing the bees, but they, they're great. I wouldn't change. Just some pictures of some of the bees that we've collected here in Texas. Uh, some are so small, you've got to actually kill the bee, unfortunately, to identify it. Uh, we've got them into six basic groups. There's the bumblebee, which is a large bee, a really important pollinator, probably the best pollinator we have. Uh, and the reason why it's best is because it does a shaking of the plant. So it takes the plant and it shakes all the pollen out which gives a better dispersion of the plant. But there's only a couple of bumblebees, it's not thousands of them. So the honeybee still wins out with sheer, with sheer numbers. We have a plaster bee, uh, and what that does, it creates a plastic film around its cocoon. Most of its, uh, high, its cocoons are in the ground. We have the mining bee, and as the name mentions, it mines into the ground and builds its colony in the ground. We have the sweat bee, which I really like because of its vibrant metallic green or blue color. It lands on your skin, it walks there for about 30 seconds and flies off. And what it's doing is busy absorbing the perspiration and hence all the minerals that are coming out of your skin. Uh, we have oil collecting bees, an interesting change of bees. So you know, half, of desert, half of Texas is virtually desert. So the plants can't put out water-based nectar because it wouldn't last. So what the plants have adapted to do is use an oil base for its nectar rather than water, which lasts a lot longer in hot climates. And there's a whole species of bees that have adapted to collecting oil-based nectar rather than water-based nectar. And then we have the bees that all the master gardeners absolutely hate, which is called the leaf cutter bee. It's the bee that go, lands on a leaf and cuts a beautiful half circle around the, on the edge, out of the edge of the, the leaf and then flies off with it, tucks it under its wing. And we'll see a few more pictures of it later on this evening. And it uses that to line its nests. Now there are lots of others, but those are the key ones that are, that are interesting. And if you're looking for a, bi a guide on it, there's a free guide from Te Texas Parks and Wildlife on how to identify the main uh, lot of bees in this country, uh, so in the state. So some more facts about it. I said 4,000 bees in the US, 1,000 in Texas, 232 in our local area. Of those, only one species is really the one that does a lot of the stinging. And out of that species is only the female that stings. And out of those bunch of females, only the last two to three weeks of her life that she sting. And because of that, we want to exterminate all 4,000 bee species in the US. As you can see, I'm slightly biased against humans. 85% <laughs> of our food is pollinated directly or indirectly by bees, which includes all our meat. Our uh, cattle, sheep, goats eat grass, grasses pollinated by bees. Now, very quietly as a footnote where you can't see, probably the most important pollinator we have in this country are the moths that actually do a lot of pollination at night, which we don't tend to look at. Uh, so what I've learned over time that unless you can turn something into a dollar, it, nobody bothers about it. It doesn't mean anything to them. So let's look at some of the dollar values. The bumblebee, the bumblebee is used a lot by uh, nurseries as well as fruit growers. They provide about $57 billion worth of pollination services in the US. The, the uh, native bees provide the North American fisheries about $28 billion of food towards the fish. And then we get other things like dung beetles that are economic. Without them, we wouldn't be able to farm because all well, the dung from our cattle would have destroyed the ground. So there are lots of other insects, not just the honeybees that are important to us. In the colony, there's three types of bees. 
The first one on the left is the worker, and she is probably the dominant bee. We have the queen bee, uh, who can sting, but generally doesn't. Uh, she lays all the eggs. Now, contrary to belief, she's not the decision maker. The worker is the decision maker. They work on a democracy. And what appears from research is that around about 120 to 150 bees have to agree at the same time on a decision, and then the whole hive follows. Uh, the queen bee, when she gets born, it takes about three days for her body to get hard enough for her to fly. She goes out, she mates with about 15 males, comes back, and then she will start laying about 2,000 eggs a day, three times her body weight. She's so busy laying, she can't do anything else. So she has a retinue of bees that will come out and look after. They clean her, they feed her eight times a day. They give her water, they um, clear a path for her. And then of course comes the more handsome of the body of everybody, the drones. I need to say I am slightly biased. Uh, drones get born in spring and the drones get kicked out as soon as there's a food shortage, which means most of my hives today don't have any drones in them because the females have chased them out. Now, because they're so busy, busy looking pretty, they don't do any work, they don't forage, they do communicate with the um, pupa in there, but the most important role is to control the genetics of the hive. There's a picture of the queen on the left. She's just come out of her um, cell. And then on the right-hand side, the big bee there is the queen walking around. So in the European honeybees, you can see the queen very easily. She's generally a light color and about twice the size of all the other bees. So she stands out. In our feral colony, she's about the same color as all the other bees and they're almost the same size. She's small and very difficult to see. So bees go through the uh, four stages, life cycle stages, egg to a larva, to a pupa, and to an adult. Uh, we refer to bees as eurosocial. And what we mean by eurosocial is that depending on the age of the bee to what job they do in the hive. So the first job a bee does, the first three days after it's born, or at least the female after she's born, is to clean. She has to clean her cell, that of any males that are around, and the hive in general. And then as she becomes a little more, uh, control of her body and her body becomes stronger, then she starts feeding the adults. And then when she's got that perfected, she then feeds the young, then she does hive maintenance. And then in the last uh, three weeks of her life, she goes out foraging. And she pretty much works until she dies. Uh, she will die because she wears her wings out. Now her wings are very thin. And if they hit a grain of sand in the air, it chips. And every time she hits a leaf or something else, it chips until the wing gets too small to provide lift. And then she's no use to everybody and she just dies and fizzles away, unfortunately. They keep their hives between 93 and 96 degrees in summer. Uh, they can tolerate a slightly higher temperature, but not willingly. They will go and collect water and they use water as a means to cool the air in the hive. In winter, they will keep the center of the hive around about 85 degrees. And uh, they do this by fanning their wings and their wing muscles. So each bee will generate about a quarter watt of heat. And they use that to keep the, the hive warm enough so they can melt the, melt the honey to eat as well as keep each other warm. Once the temperature outside gets below 55 degrees, they stop flying. It costs too much energy for them to warm themselves. And they don't have enough energy to fly, so they don't. At 45 degrees, they cannot generate enough heat to, to survive and they will die. So if you find a bee that's cold and wet, just breathe on it and that'll warm it up. And once its body temperature gets about 55, it says, thank you and flies away. It's probably the most important slide of this whole presentation. We spend a lot of time providing homes for bees, some fancy ones, some not so fancy ones, but we forget about feeding them. Now our native bees, of which there are 85% of bees are native, all live in the ground and they hibernate. So yes, they do produce honey, but they only produce enough honey for that egg to need to eat. So the honey is a carbohydrate, and that's where they get the energy from. And the other form of food that they look for is, is protein, and they get the protein from pollen, not just any pollen. A lot of our pollens here are uh, weak. In other words, their uh, protein percentage is less than 22%, which is a cutoff for the bees. And particularly our GMO foods, the pollen is protein is really low. So they will put a pollen in there for the body to grow. So for the larva to grow to a pupa, the pupa to grow into a bee. And then the last drop is the, the nectar or the honey, which they can use the energy to fly out and go and find other food. The honey bee does not hibernate. 
which is why it has to store food for winter or for us as well, midsummer when there's nothing else in flower. So looking at uh, a healthy environment, we look at the picture on the right at the bottom, a nice manicured lawn, all our HOAs love, and by the way, I'm not an HOA fan, but very little lives in that lawn because there's nothing for people, nothing for them to eat. As you provide more plants, and hence hopefully get away from the lawn and rather go to ground cover or other things, you get a lot more insects that come back in. And the higher the variety of both plant and insect life, the more healthy it's going to be. So what do we need for insects? We need to have native plants, particularly for our native bees. Now there's a relationship between the species of native bee and the species of plant. Certain native bees will only feed off certain native plants. And if that plant doesn't flower that year, the bee doesn't come out of hibernation. So if you exterminate that particular species of bee, that plant will die off because there's nothing else to, hyper to pollinate it and vice versa. Bees think and visualize in three dimensions. They have two big eyes on the side of the head called compound eyes, and they create th three dimensional maps of where they are and where the food is. So we want to create a, an environment that's just not flat, but it has undulating different things to it. So trees are great. So one tree is equivalent to an acre of flowers. Put a couple of bushes, plants at different heights so they can navigate where they're going. Make sure you've got something flowering from spring through summer and very importantly into fall, if winter possible. And provide shallow water and a beach for them to land on to walk to the water. Now they're not the best flyers, but so they will land and walk to water, otherwise they drown. And really the, the dirtier the water, the better it is for them because it will dissolve minerals and other things out of either lichen or mosses or the soil. And, that's, uh, and they can smell that. But then of course, most importantly, chemical free, please. No insecticides. Fungicides, definitely not. The bees use fungus in their hives to make the bee bread. And if you put fungicides in, prevents those fungus from growing in the hive and then they starve. And fertilizers. Fertilizers kill our native bees because they live underground. You put concentrations of nitrates into the ground, guess what happens to the bees? They die. The same thing with fireflies. So I'd much rather see something like that than seeing a nice manicured lawn. To me, a manicured lawn just costs money. It doesn't have any other value as far as I'm concerned. So water is really important for bees. We need to provide water for them. So bees generally will not feed within 20 feet of their hive, generally. Um, you can train them to be otherwise. They're very trainable, by the way. The, the uh, border guards use them to smell out uh, drugs. Uh, the military use them to smell explosives in the ground, like landmines. In fact, bees can deduce things. So there was an experiment done with, with a hive where they put some food out for the hive about a couple feet away. The bees found it and ate it. The next day, they put food double the distance away and the bees eventually found it and ate it. The third day, when they went to double that distance away, they found the bees were waiting for them. <laughs> they reduced and seen a pattern and went to go and solve the problem. So they need to fetch water. Now in a hive, there will be certain bees whose sole job for their life are water carriers. They go and fetch water, they bring it back, they feed it to the thirsty bees. They will also put it in places where it's too hot so they can vaporize it to reduce the temperature. It helps them dissolve the honey because the honey is a very concentrate and they need to add water to it. So nectar is about 85% moisture content, honey is 17%. And they have to drive off that moisture before it comes concentrate enough so it lasts. And once they get that, honey lasts forever. They've taken honey out of the Egyptian tombs and it was still edible. Uh, they need water for the lava to delight food. They need water to, for the salts that are in there. And as I said, they prefer dirty water. Nectar is their carbohydrate, which gives them the energy that they need. They collect that from flowers predominantly. Uh, in most cases, it's water-based, except for in our semi-desert areas where it's oil-based. It has five to 80% sugars, mostly sucrose, glucose, and fructose. And then the bees will add enzymes in there to break it down into smaller chains to make it easier for them to digest. The advantage of honey over a sugar is that honey has several different sugars in it that get absorbed by your body at different rates. So unlike if you take ordinary cane sugar, you get a high immediately, but then you get a very heavy low straight afterwards, very soon afterwards. Because honey dissolves at different paces in your body, 
your high is not as great, but it lasts a lot longer. Honey will crystallize over a period of time. The rate of crystallization is a function of the flower that it eats. But when it crystallizes, it's not, doesn't mean it's bad at all. It's just a different texture. Crystallized honey will also crystallize out the fructose sugar first and then later on the sucrose. So you actually separate the different flavors in the honey by doing that. But all you just warm it up and then stir it a bit and you can reuse it. So don't heat honey in the microwave because that provides small pockets of intense heat and destroys the honey as well as giving you almost a bomb type effect. Uh, you want to keep heating honey under less than 110 degrees because higher than that destroys the um, enzymes that are in the honey. So now let's think about that. Um, I'm great for looking at things as a system. What temperature do we uh, pasteurize our food at? 60 centigrade, which is 125 Fahrenheit, I think it is, somewhere around there. Which means, and then of course, do you know a store that will sell you un unpasteurized food? No, because the lawyers have got there before we did. Which means the honey that's on sitting on the shelf has been pasteurized, which means all the goodness in that honey in the store is destroyed. So all you're getting is colored sugar water. Something to bear in mind. Um, what else can I tell you about the honey? So one worker, oh no, I don't need to do that. We'll get back to that later. All right, let's have a look and see what else do they need. Pollen. Pollen is their protein. Different plants have different uh, values of pollen. Uh, bees are very particular. The higher the value of the protein content, the better the bees like it. Now, not all pollen's equal, unfortunately. So um, for as long as people tell you, you're allergic to pollen and you react to it, do come by your local beekeeper. Great, we'll sell it to you, but really it's not doing anything. Because the pollen that's affecting you is a very small pollen grain. And the bees don't collect that because it doesn't bind together. So they collect a larger grain pollen. So there's a different pollen that's affecting you to what the bees actually produce. So I'd like you to think that it does help you, but it doesn't really. Uh, what's interesting about the pollen is each flower gives pollen of a different color. So if you watch the bees coming into a beehive, you can see the color of the pollen and hence you can do, look up a chart. We've got charts for the pollen, color pollen. You can look it up and see what plant they're busy feeding on. And then I'll show you a little picture later on. If you open up the hive and you go and look on the frames, you'll see different multicolored pollens on there, which is really pretty. So what do our native bees need for, from us in order to survive? Food, of course, a form of nectar and pollen from flowers. Uh, they need a place to nest and a place to lay the eggs. Since 85% of them live in the ground, we would like you to keep a patch in your garden or somewhere that you don't till, you don't rake, you don't fertilize. Keep slightly damp, loose soil, uh, they're the best for them. And they live there the whole year round, so it's an area that you do leave open like that the whole year round. Just give me a four square meter, two, two yards by two yards would be great. Uh, you'll find a lot of insects will start increasing when they find that there. Leave the dead wood on it, leave the leaves on it, and then you'll get insects living there the whole year round. Um, bees don't, bees remember you. They've got a very good uh, brain to remember people and somehow they're able to keep that memory across generations. I'm not sure how they do that. So if you mean to bees, they remember that. And when you come next time, they'll be waiting for you. So you need to socialize with bees. So you often see pictures of old beekeepers sitting on an upturned stool in, a, in an apiary, smoking their pipe, talking to the bees. And you, know, you think that's funny, but when we teach new beekeepers, we try and tell them to meditate in front of bees. You want them to calm down because bees have got an incredibly strong sense of smell. And if you're slightly agitated, they pick it up straight away and then you become fair game. Bees are defenders. They are not aggressors. Wasps are aggressors. They're defenders and they're vegetarian. So we tell people, be calm in front of bees. You know, if you have beehive at home, Go and drink your tea or coffee or drink in front of it on a regular basis. The bees get to know that you're there. Don't use strong scents because bees communicate through smell. And you come along with a deodorant or a perfume or a, some other smell, strong smell there. That's far more powerful than what you find in nature. And it confuses them and they panic. And they look around. So what's different? What's different? Well, there's this huge body floating around. That must be the cause of it. And off they go after you. 
They also communicate through vibration. So when you walk around bees, be gentle, don't stomp around. And that's why things like ATVs and diesel engines and lawn mowers and things like that settle bees because they suddenly feel the world around them are busy vibrating and they say, oh, what's happening? So we make sure that doesn't happen. The enemies for the bees are, are animals that put their noses up the entrance. <laughs> Raccoons, bears, dogs, cattle. And so their first uh, inkling that there's danger around is first of all, something dark. So if you wear dark clothing around bees, that's where they're gonna sting you. Then they're looking for warm, moist, CO2 laden air. So most of our lawnmowers and weed eaters are all very badly tuned. So they'll give out a lot of moist CO2 laden air. And then again, there's another signal for them to come out and attack. So you wanna keep those away. Um, what else do bees need? Um, let's see on this. They need places to live. So in the ground predominantly or some soft dead wood around for the ground nesters. Yep, that covers that one. Plant flowers. So we'll talk about it again a little later on, but a lot of people will plant red flowers. Oh, let's put red flowers in. Bees can't see red. They have a different spectrum to us humans. They see ultraviolet, but they don't see red. So you want to plant plants that have flowers from the yellow through to the blue or purple range. Different types of flowers with different size of flowers, but bees have different lengths of tongues. So do our um, hummingbirds. So you want to provide some plants that have long trumpet type flowers and then some that are flat like the daisies or um, sunflowers. They need to be kept pest free. So when you go to the supermarket or someplace to get your, your uh, plants or your seeds, make sure it's not systemically treated. Systemically treated means the seeds been soaked in poison. They've genetically altered the plant to have the poison to produce the poison, which means the nectar has the poison, which means the bees will die. Now they'll tell you, oh, but don't worry about that because we have a lethal dosage of less than 50% required to kill a bee per visit. The bees never visit one flower. They visit two, 300 flowers on a trip. They will pick up that total, that lethal dosage very, very quickly. Um, we've talked about the ground nesting, the cavity nesting. So in winter, we are far too quick to cut down our old stems from plants that have died off. Leave them there. The bees will make nests inside those stems. Climate, does climate really affect the bees? Yes, it does. It affects them in many ways. It affects their temperament. So I said to you, bees breathe air directly into the body through tiny tubes and into air sacs in the body. Because those tubes are so small, call them trachea, because they're so small, uh, it takes a bit of time for the pressure to equalize from outside to inside. So you have a cold front coming through. Cold front means high pressure, right? High pressure means they feel compressed. So what do you feel like at night in bed when you've got the blankets tied around you and you can't move, you start to panic? The same thing happens with bees. Then you get a hot front, hot front coming through. Hot front means low pressure. So now they have this high pressure inside the body, also there's low pressure outside, and now they feel bloated. You know how we feel like that when we're bloated. It makes us very irritable. So those are the times the when, you, when I watch my hives, I look at the air, the air pressure and is there a change coming or just happened? And if there is, I don't go into them because I know the bees are going to be cantankerous. They can tolerate high heat. So at the moment they're tolerating the temperatures we've got because there's water around to vaporize it. So in their hives, they have four sides in the box. We put them in. Uh, one of the sides they will varnish and they blow the air across that. And as long as that side of that hive is at a lower temperature than the other three sides, that, that air will condense out water, which will cool the air and they can then use that to cool the rest of the hive. Now in trees, where they really like to go and live, the trees have got sap going around the sides. So the, the temperature in the center of the tree is a constant cool temperature all the time. They have to worry about that. We know that the range of bees are changing based on the flowers. So we've got bumblebees here now that used to stop at the Louisiana border. We've now got them in San Antonio. Simply because of the weather patterns have changed that the plants they live off have now started to grow naturally in this area. And then a little plug for research. We're constantly looking for people to collect data. So there are a lot of citizen science projects out there. There's the monarch for the butterflies, but that data is still useful to us. The Bumblebee Watch is another nice citizen science project. And of course, iNaturalist has a lot of projects going on using their data. Get involved. So bees rely on what they eat. 
So if we look at the picture on the top right, they need a, a reasonably balanced food in order to be able to deal with the pathogens. If they are the right size, then they don't have to worry about parasites. Of course, we control the insecticides or the pesticides in there, and then they can kind of deal with the, with the climate. It's really important that we provide with them a balanced food. Uh, at the bottom there, you'll see some of the bumblebees. So one in th out of three bumblebees, one of the two of the species are now on the danger list. And so we're getting a bit concerned about them. So unfortunately, our leaders that we have are voted in power because they do something. So this happened in New Braunfels about three years ago. There was an outcry because of um, mosquitoes coming out and everybody was worried about being uh, dying of dengue fever and all the other malaria fever and things like that. So the city went around and used fog machines to fog the streets to kill the mosquitoes. Within hours of doing that, we saw bunches of bunches of bees lying on the road dead as a result of the fogging. They didn't think things through. There are other options we have without having to use insecticides. So this picture's in here just to show you the plant on the side. You know we've got the male, this the stigma on the top, which has got the pollen. And then the female, the anther is inside, the bees carry it in. The bees will only visit one species of plant a day, so they don't cross-pollinate. And so when you plant plants, we want to plant them in clumps, it makes it worthwhile the bee to fly to those plants. But if it's one plant, they're not going to go there. It's not enough. And the last time I tried, this one didn't work. But I've got another one in there. No, it didn't work. Okay. So when you plant, we want to see a variety of plants, different sizes, not only in terms of plant size, but also in flower size. So the two pictures on the left is obviously the passion flower. So the first picture actually has a, a, bumble, a, a honeybee on it, on the middle right of the picture. And you'll see it's busy collecting nectar, but the pollen, the male stigma is higher up and the bee can get underneath without touching it. So it's too small to pollinate our passion fruit. But on the right hand side is a bumblebee who's the right size that goes in and is able to activate the pollen of the um, flower at the same time getting nectar. Mm -hmm. So different size flowers for different size bees. Uh, what else are we looking for? Uh, plants that have a lot of blue or purple, yellow flowers is great. Um, native preferably, forget about the GMO plants, they don't work. And um, if you and any plants that are hybridized or doubles also has almost no nectar in it. So they're also no good for us. So what is value? So if we look at the top right hand, there's a beautiful bush there, a box bush, I believe it is. Nicely round, it keeps its shape, it keeps its size, doesn't have a single leaf that has any holes on it or any bites on it. Worth a lot of dollars, but to the environment, zero. Absolutely zero. It's providing no food, for any insect or a creature, no good. The picture behind it is real value. Turk's cap, look at all the holes in the leaf. That's providing a lot of food for our insects. That's worth putting in there. Now there's value. The lawn on the left is actually not normal grass. It's something called thunder grass. And your speaker next week should be, or next time should tell you a lot about thunder grass because they developed it. It's three native Texas grasses they put together, grows to about three to four inches tall and uh, grows in, in full sun as well as in shade. It requires mowing about once, maybe twice a year. So there's a big plus for that. And then you ask them very nicely, please put in two inch high flowers in that seed mix. And then they'll put that in and then you plant that instead. So back to what bees. So I said to you, they've got these big compound eyes on the side that see the three dimensional space. They also have three simple eyes on top of their head those look, use, look for polarized light and they can see through clouds, they can see where the sun is and they use that to determine time of the day. So you guys have probably noticed the sun early in the morning is a different color to what it is midday, which is a different color to the afternoon. The bees can pick that up and they can determine time on that. And some of the new cell phones use the same technology to adjust the picture of your phone. So the bees got that long ago. So we'll see that on the top row on the right hand side, there's a flower, we see it as yellow. The bees see it as a combination of white and red. So if you take your flower and eat at night and you put a black light on it or an ultraviolet light, you'll see the color is very different. They use that to determine whether the flower is mature enough for nectar. And the other interesting thing is actually a lot of our birds, particularly our female birds, which are gray and unimportant, 
put a black light on them, you'll be surprised how much color they've got. It's just because they also see a different spectrum to what we see. Just a picture of a comb with some bees on it. I thought it was nice, I included it, why not? Uh, when the, the forager bee comes into the hive, it's not allowed up into where the comb is because it's been outside, it's been exposed to disease. So they don't want it to come in and then destroy the colony. So it's, it comes into the entrance or the ground level. And then the house bees go down and they fetch the, whatever it's, the nectar off it and then take it up. And that's one of the dances they have because if they don't get service within 90 seconds, they do a linear dance at the bottom saying, guys, I've been here for 90 seconds. Where's the service in this place? But these two bees are busy transferring from one to another. It could be water, it could be nectar. Oh, I had it twice in there. Um, right, we've covered that already. So there's a picture of some nect some uh, pollen that's in a, in a hive, uh, predominantly orange and yellow, but you get them from whites to, to purples. Uh, but if you look at these cells, some of the newer ones are actually circular. So this whole myth that bees make hexagonal cells is not actually true. They make circular cells. And then as the wax dries, it pulls it into a hexagonal shape, which I believe is due to the surface tension of the, of the um, cell. You always notice at the bottom of some of the cells that don't have pollen and there's a Y at the bottom, a Y image. That's because the two sides of the frame of the, co of the comb is offset by half a comb. And that's where they can get a high density packing because they're very after heat um, conserve, conservation in there. And then that Y image needs to face to the center. It's called household positioning. And that's one of the reasons why a lot of the commercial beekeepers and the new hobbyists have problems with temperament of their hives is because they mix it up. It has to be always facing the center of the hive. The cells are also pitched at about 15 degrees up from the horizontal, and that's to prevent, whoops, a spinning mistake. That's to prevent the honey from flowing out. Um, what else can I tell you about that? That's about all I can tell you on that slide. Honey, honey in the store is usually mixed, blended, doctored, poison, you name it. It's, they've done it to it, to give you a constant flavor. So it's the same wherever you buy it, whenever you buy it. Also nice and clear, can you see through it? Because who will buy murky honey? Nobody will. So what they've done is they filtered all the goodness out of the honey to make it clear. They've blended it and then sell it. Now, to give you an example of one honey I do know about, so the Manuka honey from New Zealand is a medicinal honey. We're actually developing our own version of it here in Texas using the Texas native uh, plants and UTSA is doing the research on that. But more Manuka honey is sold in the UK than is produced by New Zealand. So who's getting the fake Manuka? And uh, by the way, Manuka is not edible, so don't try. Uh, there's a tasting wheel to give you all the different flavors that are in honey. So it depends on where the bees are and what time of the year you take the honey off, it has a different flavor. They're influenced by the microclimate. So what you read on the internet generally doesn't apply to us in San Antonio. So don't try and learn from the internet. It's usually wrong. Uh, I've got hives right from Petit all the way across to Kingsville and now soon into uh, Gonzales. Each one of them, even when they've got three or four miles apart, will have different flavors. And so I don't blend the honey. You will find that if you go back there, you'll see the different honeys. They all come from local hives, but each of them have not been blended and they get totally different flavors. So buying imported honey, even when it says Texas honey, you look at that and you, and you look at the fine print, at least California have now specified you have to tell the country of origin of the honey. So now you've got Californian honey blended with Brazil honey, Venezuelan honey, interesting. Go and look at the FDA of the, um, the um, tax and excise website and you go and see the amount of honey that's imported from these different countries. You'll see over one year, all of a sudden import, importation is thousands of tons more than was the previous year. How do they able to produce so many bees to make so much honey in one year? Makes you think, doesn't it? Where is that honey coming from? So you go down to the border, you can buy a gallon of honey for $2. Where's that honey coming from? And is it honey? So in China, the, where are the bees? They're not out pollinating anymore because they now they've got a huge number of humans whose sole job is to go and pollinate the flowers. The bees in warehouses and they have honey drips into them to produce the honey which they export around the world. So please don't buy imported honey. So I said it crystallizes. So there's a jar of honey, it's crystallized out. 
The crystals at the bottom there are nice. It's a different texture. Uh, we will take those crystals. We will either whip them up with air to create a nice frothy honey, which gives you a different flavor, or we'll actually grow crystals of the same size for crystallized honey, creamed honey, which gives you another different flavor, all from the same, the same material. So even when it goes like that, if you don't want to eat it, just foam me up. I'll come collect it. I'll blend it and resell it at twice the price. So I had to put this in because on the internet's a great source for pictures. And even though it's not fact, I saw the picture. I thought I've got to use this picture. So well, how did I learn about bees? Well, I was fortunate to have a mentor called Dee Lusby. She now lives in Arizona. She used to be in Texas and Oklahoma. She's probably the most knowledgeable uh, beekeeper in the US. So that I learned from her. I also learned from NMB School and really the state, the Texas Beekeepers Association. And thanks to them, I then eventually became a master naturalist. And thanks to them, I found out about Native Plant Society. So that was very useful. That was the practice, um, which over about eight years here in Texas. But most of my learning has become, come from the hundreds of stings that I've got because I made mistakes. At least I did learn from them. So are we allergic to bee stings? Well, less than 0.01% or something very low, we, uh, people are actually allergic. We all swell. We all get sore when we get stung. It doesn't necessarily mean you're allergic. If you get stung and your chest starts to collapse on you, you know you've got a problem. Most people die, but not because of the sting, but because of the adrenaline they produce that closes down the organs through panic. So if you get stung, just relax. Just calm down. Rub some bicarbonate soda or baking powder in it, that's what I use, it takes the sting away and stops the swell. And after, for me, it took about eight stings before I stopped reacting to them. Unless I go for about two months with no stings, and I got to start all over again. So my patient wife at the back, there's up to six at the moment. I've got to try and get her to get two more and then she won't feel it anymore. <laughs> so as human, what we've done, actually, I've run out of time. Where's my time? Yep, 7.55, right, I've got to end this. We did have this theory about bigger is better in the farming industry. So we upsized our bee and every time we upsized our bee, we had endless problems with them, which is what we have the problem today with our European honeybee. The European honeybee has a, short, has a range of less than a mile. Our feral bee has a range of about 10 miles. Uh, the European honeybee is very susceptible to different diseases and mites getting into our local bees are not. Uh, the lifespan of a honeybee, European honeybee has dropped in half over the last 50 years because of our meddling in it. The diff uh, enemies of bees. He's trying to tell me, to, whoops, where am I going? Are um, things like uh, birds, there's a guinea fowl, uh, the rubber fly, scorpions, spiders, and of course the biggest enemy is us humans. So the bees pack their bags and off they go. Uh, there's a bee feeding from, um, Blue bonnet. I took the picture because I never see bees on blue bonnets, but I did see this one time. So I had to have a picture. In that little file is the amount of honey that one bee in its lifetime will produce. So, in a teaspoon of honey, there's about 12 bees' lifetimes worth of work in, in doing that. Um, the bees, the most famous dance for bees is a figure of eight. And that gives the direction of where the towards the sun of where the food is, and then the number of waggles on it tells it how far it is. So I saw this on the internet today, so I thought I had to use it as well. Unfortunately, honey doesn't help you with the pollen, but I like you to think so. Uh, a leaf cutter, or sorry, sweat bee, which is one of my favorite bees, the metallic green or metallic blue. Um, they very, very seldom sting, they can do, but as the mother looks after the young and if she dies, then there's nobody looking after the young. So she knows that she won't sting unless you really, really squash her or corner in her hive. Uh, there's a leaf cutter bee, probably taking a leaf into a stem. Um, mining bee in the ground. So when you see those holes, sometimes there's wasps, sometimes there's bees, bumblebees in the ground. Somebody coming to see what's going on. Another bee coming up. So I create hives for bees out of wooden boxes. Uh, we've changed a lot of how we do it. You can do it with my rustic old woodwork way. Otherwise, if you're really interested, you can do it in a very nice way and make it look interesting. But it doesn't matter, whatever you do, please provide a nice environment with lots of flowers for the bees. Um, and then in, end up, um, this is on a farm. They had bees in their cupboard. So the left hand is the cupboard, the right hand side, you see the bees at the top there. 
So having a look inside, there's the comb with all the bees. Waiting for me at the entrance to the hive were all the guard bees, busy rubbing their hands and you know, three pairs of them saying, here he comes, here he comes. Unfortunately for them, I went around the back of the cupboard, extracted the bees from behind, and when they turned around, there was nothing else to protect. So I like uh, Doug telling me, join us in making a homegrown national park movement and provide native plants for us. Thank you. We don't have any questions online right now, but if anybody has questions here. Yes, sir. Is there any truth to the idea of bee therapy going to be So is there any truth to apotherapy and these things? Yes, there is. So there are quite a few medical doctors that believe in it, and they also have a lot of them that don't believe it. But if you go overseas, it's common. Uh, the, the protein in the sting actually punches holes in the cancer or in the tumor to allow your own, your own um, body's uh, um, attack on it. So the, what's interesting about the bees is that the bee propolis, which is what I call bee medicine, as well as the bee protein, has never, there's no disease known that has ever become immune to it. It even does the superbugs we've got in the hospitals. So yes, I'm a firm believer in that it does work. Yes, sir. When you're going to the store and buying plants from big box store, how do you know whether they have been treated with neonicotinoids or not? Uh, how do I know whether they've been, uh, been uh, got insecticide in them? Well, the thing is, how do you know a person's turning being honest? I don't. So you look at the label. Now, they're meant to put in a, a picture on the label if it's bee-friendly. So there should be a little image of a bee on, on that label if it's bee friendly. And there are several um, nurseries in San Antonio that do do that. But in terms of the big box stores, there's no way of really knowing. If it's a seed, the seed will be a different color. You can see it has, been, it has a color difference, but if, once it's grown into a plant, I don't know. Yes, sir? If you put in a water feature for the bees and you throw one of those mosquito dunks into it, will that hurt the bees? No, no, that's fine. Yes, sir. Um, we have two lantana sets here. You know, the native ones are more reddish. The other ones are yellow, more yellowish and pinkish. So, if I were to put some side by side, would I expect that the uh, the non-native lantana would actually attract bees more than the other from the proper differences? Well, so our native ones are orange in color. The non-native ones are purples and whites and yellows. They have yellow. Yeah. So at home, I've got the different varieties. I don't see bees on the white one, but I do see bees on the yellow, on the orange one. You see it on the yellow. But that's that remember that colors for our eyes. The bees see a difference. I put a black light on it and see what the bees see. If they if you can put a black light on it and you see other than black on it, because usually your red will go black under UV light, um, then the bees can see it. What's also interesting about that is bees, when they fly, pick up a lot of static electricity. And when they land on a, on a flower, they transfer their charge to the flower. So when another bee comes flying over their flower, if it picks up that charge, the sense the charge field, it knows that flower has been visited, it doesn't stop. So during the day when that, that plant will have a prime time in which they're visiting, it's visited that much, then it, it, it won't be visited for X hours or how does that work? Usually for the rest of the day. So our native plants is easy, it's the rest of the day. So some of our non-native plants absorb enough moisture to create to regenerate some of that nectar later on in the couple of hours later. Bees will forage. In the morning, the bees leave and they go off a long distance to forage. They come back around noon and they spend like an hour or two at home, back in the hive, and then they go back out in the afternoon and their trip in the afternoon is local. So they're not too far away from the hive when night comes. And so a lot of your local plants will be, will be had visited, the bees visit in the morning, it's bees from a long way away. If they get visited in the afternoon, it's local bees. So when do they start visiting the plants? In Texas, what, when, when, the when rise? So when will the, when the bees will start visiting plants? Yeah, well, what's, you know, it's in the summertime. What time, what time do you expect? 
8 a.m., 7 p.m. I mean, I grew up on the farm. I got to 5 a.m., you know, to do the cows, you know. And so it, the bees must have some time to get it. Yeah. It depends on the species of the bee. So we have a bee called the squash bee, and it gets up just before the sun gets up and go visits all our uh, uh, pumpkin plants, squash plants, because their flowers open early in the morning and they droop very quickly after that. So they've learned to get up early. Then you get the other bees that are, will get up at about seven, eight o'clock in the morning. You get some bees only leave at nine o'clock in the morning, different species. But around that time, usually between 8.30 and 9.30, most of the bees will leave the hive, the foragers at least. Yes, sir. Okay, this year we had great with uh, Minarda. So lots of purple flowers and uh, beekeepers were saying they were seeing more purple pollen. Mm -hmm. And I heard this other woman from south of town saying that the Minarda mm -hmm. might have uh, some, help the bees be more resistant to the mites. Have you heard anything about that? I don't know the plant. What I do know is bee mites. Bee bomb. Bee bomb. Uh, uh, I'm not aware of bee balm being having any impact on the mites whatsoever. I know that things like um, hops, uh, help me out beekeepers, I see two of the three of them sitting there. Um, what else, what is that uh, essential oil we put in? Thyme. Thyme does keep the mites away. It blocks the ability to sense each other for mating. Um, hops also helps that. I've not heard of bee balm at all doing that. Okay, I'll get to you at the back. A couple of years ago. Yeah, So a couple of years ago, we had a couple of weeks. Yeah. A couple of years ago, we had a couple of weeks of overcast weather, and it was reported the bees were attacking everybody. I don't know. I didn't hear about it. I very much doubt it because the bees can see through cloud. So it's not going to affect them in that way. Unless there was pressure changes that are happening at the same time to make them irritable. I cannot see cloud having any impact on them other than calming them. So I don't know, but it doesn't sound reasonable. Yes, sir. Uh, well, four slides back, we had the Fredford and the second photo from the left, it was some big old bug, flying bug that was eating the bee. In, that? Oh, that was a rubber bee. That's a, a rubber fly. <laughs> yeah. So one of the pictures we showed in the slide had a rubber fly eating a bee. Um, that's what it was. Yeah. We've got a question on chat. Um, with a severe drought in San Antonio, would you recommend feeding the bees if there aren't enough flowers available to sustain them? The answer simply is yes. I'm not going to let bees starve and die. So if there's not enough food around for them and they haven't stored enough, yes, I will feed them. Yeah, sure. To follow up on that question, how do you know that they've stored them out? By looking inside the hive. How many, how many, how many frames do you need to have of honey to brood or to remember the chat? So for this time of the year, I'm looking for six to eight frames of honey to last until September. And then from September through to March, I'm looking for another six to eight frames of honey. Yes, ma'am. My question is to presumably by cultivating honey, there's surplus in the hive. How do you make that calculation about how much will save to collect? So the, the question is: how do we calculate how much honey should be left in the hive, how much we can take? So the bees do produce a surplus of honey. Uh, to survive what's coming down the line. It is a, it's a problem with beekeepers, particularly new beekeepers, because they tend to take off too much. So I look at the size of the hive, how many bees I've got in the hive, and I basically work on the, on the fact that if I've got two boxes, I use deeps, two, two boxes on the hive, then I'm going to leave at least three frames per box. So two boxes means I leave six frames, three boxes I'll leave 12 frames of honey. That's my rule of thumb. It's, uh, and for the most part, I've been successful that way. If I take off too much honey, then I have you start feed them, which is sugar water. I do add, I can add different minerals, vitamins, and probiotics in them. Uh, we are told they help. We don't really know whether they do or don't help. But we do know that uh, sugar water does reduce the lifespan of the bee. And also bees battle to build fat globules as a result of that. So um, 
it's not a good idea to feed them sugar water, preferably rather honey and their own honey because the honey we're buying in the stores has a lot of insecticides, particularly Roundup in all of it. And then you're feeding that to the bees and you want to know why the young are dying is because of the, the contaminated honey. In fact, one of the reports I saw last year, they were saying out of the 12 honeys that took off the shelf of the East Coast, 11 of them had above EPA regulations of amount of Roundup in them. Ma'am? And then a little caption, some bees saying, uh, please help the bees out by putting some supplemental nutrition. Um, it was actually in Spanish. It was from a source, I guess, in Mexico. Is that an idea that should be done with any fruit? And would that help some? So should we put out food for bees? In this particular case, it was mashed up apples, I think you said. Yes. Uh, would it help the bees? Is it a habit we should be doing? Um, Yes, I would put something out. They like something sweet. Uh, for, you know, really ripe fruit, they will go for the sweetness in it, the sap in it. So yes, I would do that. They love molasses. So if you're on a farm or something like that, and you feed your cattle molasses, they love that. Uh, yes, sir. What is a good local source for finding out more about beekeeping for people around? What is the local source for finding out beekeeping for those who are interested? There's several beekeepers. There's an Alamo beekeepers. There's Halotus beekeepers. There's Camel County. Um, I'm from the bees in the east and Guadeloupe County. So those will help. The Egg Life Extension Office in Bear County, uh, they have a bee course for beginners uh, run by Molly Keg. Keg. Uh, there's the state beekeepers. So you go on Texas uh, beekeepers, you will find there's a lot of references there. You can go to it. Uh, if you're looking to do treatment-free beekeeping, then I would go to a um, website called Michael Bush or Bush Farms. He's also got a book out of it. Um, he studied bees a couple of years before me, also from D. Lusby. Um, very easy to read. Uh, generally, that's what I would follow. Uh, all the rest of these dictionaries and dummies to beekeeping and things like that, don't worry about them. I'd rather go to those who actually done it. Uh, Ma'am? So where are the minor, minor bees in the, in the ground? Are they in our grass? So the answer generally is they're not in our grass because we walk too much up and down on the grass. There's too much traffic on it. So generally, they're not going to be there. They prefer dryish, dryish soil. Uh, they'll dampen it and, and secure it themselves. Uh, in places where you don't till, back of your flower beds, in the corner of the garden, that's where you'll probably find them. Yes, sir. Do you know offhand if there are any laws against keeping bees inside the city limits? No, San Antonio allows you to keep bees. I think they limit you to two bees per property. I'm not sure of that, but they do allow it. There's some directions, some, some rules that we tend to tell you, you don't face a beehive towards your neighbor's window or a door. It has to be at least six feet, I think it is six or 10 feet from the fence. And there needs to be a barrier between you and your neighbor. So they have to fly up rather than fly over. Because once bees fly up, then they don't come immediately down. So a six foot fence, uh, not a chain link fence or a chicken wire fence, because they go straight through that. But a, you know, a pole fence or bushes or trees, and they go up and up. There we go. That'll work. Yes, sir. What percentage of beekeepers in general are treatment free? Is it a high percentage, a small percentage? Or what? There are some countries that are 100% treatment free and they don't have any problems with mites and they don't spend billions of dollars on treatments. Here in the US, it's probably, I'm guessing, probably around 20, 15 to 20% of them are treatment free. What's the economics of that? Fantastic. I don't pay for chemicals, I don't have losses, and I have a stronger bee. So why, why, why is it so We're betting all about dollars. So if it is so successful, why, why don't the commercial guys use it? Because the treatment-free feral bee does not tolerate dumb, stupid, rough beekeepers. <laughs> and if you are short of food, they pack their bags and they leave. They don't stay. Yes, sir. At the back. 
Closure slides show a neat hotel with no resto. Are those made up things? Are they worth doing? So if the, if the holes in them are start from about an eighth of an inch to about three eighths of an inch, uh, then they're worthwhile. If they're bigger than that, they're not worthwhile. And they need to be about four to six inches deep. You need to put them elevated so the other animals and creatures can't get to them. Uh, keep them shaded, keep them waterproof. And underneath them, you need to have some mud, some soil with some water on it so it's mud so they can pick up that mud and go and line it. Otherwise they won't come in there. Would you mind telling the difference about the B hotels? Oh, sorry, that was for B hotels. Do B hotels actually work? Yeah, I just have question. a quick question about uh, the countries in Europe that were having bee problems. How do you think when they banned neonicotinoids in Europe that helped the bee populations? Big time. Big time help. Big time help. No doubt about it. Neonectoids affects the neurological uh, process in the bee, so they lose direction. They forget where they are. They forget what to do. And a bee has three brains, basically. The main brain was eyes and the senses. The other one to the thorax and the one for the abdomen. And those things go out of wink and the whole bee rips itself to pieces. So there's honey at the back if you want to try it. Thank, Thank you. you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was so interesting. And um, we have some plants in the back. And before everybody gets up, um, for the Zoom people, we're going to turn the camera around. Oh, stop sharing. No, Roger. And, oh, no, they can see it, but okay. our people in here Good. can't see it. That's not as much fun. No. Okay, but the Zoom people are the ones that need to see it. Can you stop sharing? Are you sharing or no? Sure. Actually, they can see it. Oh, everybody say bye to the Zoom people. <laughs> we had a request. The Zoom people were feeling a lot of our members can't make it. And so they were feeling that loss of connection. So thanks everybody for saying goodbye. <laughs> I don't know what's happening with this.